to be able to worship our holy and divine righteous God. I want you to know that you may be going through a difficult time this day. Some may see this day as not so happy, though we deem it happy Mother's Day. Some may have not have had, not have had a godly mother in their life. Some may be dealing with a mother who's not here anymore. And I want you to know that you are loved, God loves you, and God understands your grief. My, my focus this morning is not just to single out or to talk about just mothers. I want to focus upon some examples in the Bible about women who served. Because whether you're a mother or not, you are highly valued in, in the kingdom of God. You are very important. And never see yourself as someone is not important. God loves you. Jesus died for you. He gave his life for you. And he, and, we, and he is appreciative of your labor in the kingdom. Where would we be? Where would the kingdom of God be without women who serve? You can think about the many. Go, go, your, go in your mind at this time. All those that served in the scriptures. You might think about Deborah. You may think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. You may think of, you may think of the woman that had that alabaster box of oil that anointed Jesus' feet and wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. And you get Sarah. I mean, you can go to the list as long, and, and, and we'll look at some of these this morning. But women play an important part in the body of Christ. We all have our part to play in the body of Christ. God has given us, through the Scriptures, what we are to do. And both men and women are highly valued in the kingdom of God. Galatians 3.28, For there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all can have a part in the body of Christ. Through the Bible, women have set wonderful examples. Perhaps one of the best, one of a good example is Proverbs 31, which you can spend a whole entire time on dwelling about the, the, the wise woman and how she is valued. But notice number one, we'll think about women who gave liberally. Exodus 35, verses 25 and 26 says, And all the skilled women spun with their hands and brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet material and fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred with a, with a skill spun the goat's hair. There are a lot of women that can do amazing things. Better than men can. I am not a good quilt maker. Matter of fact, I can't even tell you how to begin. But I appreciate those that make quilts because that takes skill. And that is appreciative of those that do that. And we see, we see here we see the example in the scripture of women doing that. Women do have a big role in the scripture, as well as men. Don't don't sell up, don't don't sell women short, because they are highly just as valuable as we are, as men. Because God Christ died for every woman. I think about Mark chapter 12, about women who gave liberally. You remember the widow that gave in two mites? He sat down opposite, this is Jesus, sitting down opposite the treasury and began observing how the multitude were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. Now Jesus is not writing this so that we come behind everybody and look and see what everybody's giving on the first day of the week. He's given this as an example. He's given it as an example to see what it, what it means to sacrificially give. He notices the, the, there are many people that, that gave. There are people that gave. They put, some gave in a, 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 lot of, a, lot of fun, a lot of money. But he noticed particularly this, this widowed woman who more than likely, who, who, who we see through the scripture didn't have much on her. She wasn't rich as far as money is. 
It says, a poor, a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which amount to a cent. Now think about what all a penny can buy in this country. Can you think of just one thing? There's not many things, if any, that a penny would buy in this country. So let, let that sink in as an example of what, what Jesus is illustrating here. Of all the rich people that gave in of their means, he notices this woman who all she had was two small copper coins that amounted to a penny. And what he does is he sees this example and he calls his disciples over. In other words, to say, I want you to, I want you to notice something. Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. Jesus didn't say, well, these rich people that gave in, they're condemned because they didn't give everything. He's given to the sample, so let me show you something. This woman could have, could, have, could have said, well, this is all I have. I can't give anything. But she out of the abundance of her heart, from the heart, because she wanted to give, put it in anyway. And Jesus uses that example to say, what a good example she sets before you. She gave everything she had. You know another example you can take from this as well? Paul wrote the church of Corinth about how Jesus, though he was rich, yet he became poor for our sakes. Jesus values the heart. He valued the heart of this woman. And many would say, well, this woman is very poor. Well, in the world's terms, yes, she is. But when it comes to God, she may be richer than those rich men. Because Jesus would even say in the Sermon on Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit, but they shall see God. Because even though we may have nothing to our name, we are extremely rich in Christ. Ephesians 1 3, we have the blessings that are in Christ. The blessing of eternal life that is far more valuable than anything this world has to offer. This widowed woman gives us an example of what it means to, to sacrificially give and it's also an example of who Jesus is. Because did not Jesus give His everything for us? Including His life. He took the beating prior to the cross. He took the cross for us. Even though He was innocent, He took that for us. He gave Himself. He even said, No one takes my life. I give it myself. Jesus could have called legions of angels to destroy the world, but he did not because he saw man. He loved man. He knew about the promise of God, his Father. And he accomplished that plan because that's how much he loves us, that he would give himself for us. Now, what a, what a God we serve. Women, you can, ladies, you can be a, you are a import, an important part in the body of Christ. Never let someone tell you you're not because you are, because Scripture says you are. Mark fourteen three through nine, and while he was at, think about this one, while he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table. Not that's interesting when you think about Simon the leper. How many people would go to a leprous house, under, especially under the old law of Moses? A leper would be seen as unclean. And, and if you came in contact with a leper, you would then be unclean under the, under the law of Moses. But why did Jesus 
go to this leper's house because Jesus cared about his soul. Whereas the world and some, even some in the religious world that day, the Pharisees, wouldn't, as you see in Matthew 23, they bind heavy burdens and they do all kinds of stuff because they didn't care about the soul. They just cared about their own position and their own ego. That's not Jesus. Jesus sat with those that were unwanted because he saw the value in who they are because they needed the gospel as well as those that were rich in the world. Simon the leper, and reclining at the table, there, there came a woman with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume of pure nard. Notice that. She could... Here's for example. Here's an example for us too. She could have saved this alabaster oil or whatever, whatever, whatever it is, perfume, whatever it may be. She could have, she could have done, uh, invested in it and got, got, got some money from it. Kept it for herself... But notice in this example what she does. Like the previous, she broke the vial and she pours it over his head. But notice what the reaction of some of the people were. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? Isn't it interesting how when something good is done, there's always got to be someone to complain why did you do that? Why didn't this happen? Why, why, would, why would you waste that? Jesus says, I don't know. Watch this. It's, and, and here's what they said. For this perfume might have been sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus says, leave her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For the poor you always have with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them. You can do them good. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, that also which this woman has done shall be, shall, shall be spoken in memory of her. Jesus valued what this woman did to her, did, did for him. Jesus told those people that were indignant and was more focused upon that, that what happens that cost him rather than the good deeds she did. And Jesus says, You leave her alone. Notice her heart. That's the kind of heart that Jesus looks at in us. A heart that's willing to give up whatever, no matter the cost. Because that's how much we love Jesus and we want to do what is good. And if, and if, people, and if people complain about it, let them complain. Because when they complain, they're not, they're not a friend of God. Paul said, do all things without grumbling and complaining. Philippians 2.14 and, and, and I don't have time to, to, to look at it, but in Numbers it talks about the people, how they would constantly complain about how, they, how God gave them bread, and they complained about that. God, God would give them something else, and, and they complained about that. This is constant complaining, complaining, and you, you sometimes have to spring out and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Haven't you noticed that God has provided you for your daily food, and there's people that are these other nations that don't have food, and yet, yet God has taken care of you? Have you ever thought? Have you ever thought being selfish for a minute and appreciate what you have? <coughs> have you ever thought about this as well? Think about think about the outcome versus the cost. Yes, the perfume was expensive, but she saw that as as, as doing what she could to serve Jesus. And the eternal reward far outweighs, far outweighs how much that perfume costed. And that's Jesus' point. And, we, and, and this is recorded for every generation to take note of her example and to follow that serving is more than what, what it costs. It's about the outcome. And that doing good may be more for the person that's doing good than the one receiving the good. Have you ever done something good for someone? And it may be the case that, that per of course, that person is thankful that you did something for them. But do you feel like you've been the one that benefited the most out of that? 
that happens a lot because it feels good to do good. When does it ever feel truly wrong to do good? It doesn't. It should feel good. It should encourage us. It should boost us to know that we are like our Savior. Number two, think about women who supported Jesus. <clears throat> think about when Jesus died at the cross. Who was there? Where was the disciples during his trial? They all left. I don't read of the women leaving. Mark 15, 40 through 41, and there were also some women looking on. There might have been a couple that some had left, but not everyone left. There were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus, uh, Mary the mother of James, the way, excuse me, and Joseph and Salom. And he was in Galilee. They used to follow him and minister to him, and there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. These women had blessed him during his ministry in Galilee, and now they were doing that. Now they were there when he was dying, encouraging him, showing love to him. Right there, when Jesus is, down, is, is on the cross, enduring all that pain, you remember who's there? Predominantly, there was, a, there was a lot of women there. Of course, there was John, and he said, "Behold your mother. Behold your mother." She stood by Jesus even in the darkest moments. She gives us an example of what it means to stick to it. Stick with it. What it means to care even when your child is going through ultimate grief. Now we know that Jesus is the Son of God, but still she cared for Jesus. She was there. I think about what John would have, would have what was thinking through his mind when Jesus was there on the cross and said, Behold my mother. Behold your mother. And I, I believe what Jesus is saying to John there is, She's your mother now. You take care of her. You take her. You take care of her. She's cared for me all this time. Now you take care of her. Jesus valued everyone, including women. And there were many who served Jesus. And thank God they did. Thank God they did. There were women who supported Jesus. Number three, there were women who prayed. Hannah prayed and God gave her Samuel. Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And she greatly distressed... Prayed to the Lord. She went to the right. She went to the right avenue. She went to the Lord and wept bitterly. Don't be afraid if you're going through grief or whatever, whatever it may be—a struggle. If you need to cry out to God in your prayer, cry out. Don't feel embarrassed that you do, because God hears your tears as well as your words. Because Christ Himself suffered like we have. He understands what it means to suffer. He understands what it means to be distressed and, 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 and to be sorrowful. But notice what Hannah does. And she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a raider shall never come on his head. Now, Hannah is not doing what some people call bargaining with God. That's not what she's doing. She's serving as an example that she wants a son, and she wants to dedicate it to God. There's nothing wrong with that. Hannah prayed. Hannah gives us an example of, a, of, of one who trusted in God that He would answer her. God answers all of our prayers. Not always in the, in the way that we would want them answered. But God knows what's best and He answers them. Sometimes that answer is no. Because, that, because what we've asked for may not be what we need. Sometimes we go for what, our, what we want instead of what we need. 
Not saying that that's necessarily wrong in of itself, but God knows what we need. He knows about our struggle. It's not that it's not that God is ever oblivious to what we suffer through. Why? And then someone asks, "Well, if God knows what I need, if God if God knows my stress, why do I need to go to God in prayer?" And the answer is, He wants you to communicate. He knows, but He wants you to know that He knows. He has provided for us an avenue that we communicate with God. Our needs, even in the darkest moments of our life, He is there. He hears us. And of course, you know the rest of the story. God gave Samuel. And Hannah did exactly as she said. She paid her vow. She serves as an example for us too. I think about women who trained their children. 2 Timothy 1.5 For I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you. Timothy's faith was not hypo hypocritical. And, that's, and notice what Paul says. Which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice and I am sure that it's in you as well. Grandmothers and mothers play a vital part in shaping the child and where he should go. Could you imagine where Timothy may be if it hadn't been for Lois and Eunice? Perhaps he wouldn't have been, there wouldn't have been an epistle written to him. Never think that our example is for naught. Even if they don't listen to you, you have done your duty. Because you will not bear their iniquity, they can't bear your iniquity, they will have to answer for themselves. But don't ever forget that you played a vital part in their life. Whether they respond to it or not. Never think that, well, I think all that for vain because none of them. There may be a case where someone has done all their best and the child goes out and they, and they, and they, and they leave the Lord and never come back. And the person may think, well, I did all that for nothing. They never listened to me. I, what did I do that for? They didn't listen to anyone. God says, stop. Don't think like that. 1 Corinthians 55 says, your labor is not in vain anymore. It is not in vain. You have done exactly the way God has said to do and for that, God is pleased. Remember, we all will have an answer for ourselves. And God loves you. He loves everybody. There's always hope. Always. God appreciates you. I hope you know that. I hope we all know that. Even when it feels like when we're sitting in our bedrooms upset because we feel like I'm all wrong. I, I have nobody. I feel I feel a pain sometimes for those who live alone. Sometimes if I have nobody to talk to. I, 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 I'm just here alone. God is there. And my heart is with you. I understand. And God Understands. Do not fear going to him. Thus, we have a friend Jesus. He's there whether nobody else will be there for you or not. He's there listening. Yes, my child, what is it? What do you need? He never hangs up the phone. He never puts us on hold. He never has us go to a menu option and slip this button, button, button. He's right there. Talk to him. Talk to him. Talk to him. He is there. And Paul encourages Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, convinced of knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. How did Timothy know what to do to be saved? By, by, by his mother and grandmother teaching him the Bible. They know. You, be, you might be surprised at how much children can, can learn. 
don't sell children short. They can learn more than you think they can. And they pick up on things and they think, and you think they can. For example, I know uh, I was reading a book by Phil Sanders. He speaks on the Search of the Board's Way. He wrote a book called Drift. And in there, he talked about how he visited this congregation. I can't remember what city it was. It was in some city. He didn't know anything about it. They were not like vacationing or something. I can't remember what the deal was. But he stopped in. He talked to the Mormon church. He said, Church of Christ out in sign. He comes in. He's got his daughters with him. Very young age. And the service started and noticed that the, they had a praise scene sitting on the front. And then the preacher started preaching and he said, well, I've got so many notes up here. He took his Bible and he tossed it aside. And he said at that moment, his daughter looked up, at, looked up at him and said, Daddy, and she was real young, Daddy, are you sure this is the Church of Christ? Young people know. They know. Because they can be molded by parents to know the difference between right and wrong. And they'll learn that. Now they can walk away from it just like you and I can. But that teaching, that's the point of Proverbs 22 6. When he is old, he shall not depart from it. It's not saying that he will never depart from the faith, it says he will never forget that teaching that you instilled in that person. He may not live by it, but he'll remember all the times you sat and talked with him. That's the point of the proverb. You may feel it's in vain, but it is not because they will remember. And it may be at some point later down their life, they, they, come, they, they find themselves at a place, at a crossroads, and don't know what to do, and they remember, ah, oh, I want to go back to what Mom said, or what Dad said. Maybe the answer is in Scripture, and then later on they may come to it and obey it, all because you didn't give up. It can still happen. Notice that you're rebuffed. You are loved, and we have to continue in the things we have learned. Titus 2, 3, and 3 through 5, Paul writes to the young Titus, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips or enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be dishonored. There are things that younger women can learn from older women. There are things that us younger guys can learn from older guys because they have experience. They know what, what, what goes on in life. Don't sell their wisdom short. There is value in that wisdom. I know you may, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of times in life, especially the generations that's up today, don't, don't, don't even care about your generations. Don't even want to seek for wisdom. Want to go out the wrong way and say, well, who cares? That's, that's just, that's just, they're just a bunch of old fogies that, that don't know anything. To the contrary, they're not old fogies that don't know anything. They know more than you think they do. And you need to listen to them. It doesn't mean that there are some, some nuts out there, but. For the most part, there is value in those that have experienced it. Everyone should be treated the same way we want to be treated. Because that's the value that Christ has in us. And notice lastly, number five, women who served specifically. Acts 9.36, now in Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. Verse 39, And Peter rose and went with them, and when he had come, they brought him into the upper room, and all the wid widows stood beside him weeping, and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used, used to make while she was with them. Wow. They're up there with Peter saying, Look at what she, look at what she did. The things you do can make an impact for people and sometimes you don't even know it. Sometimes it goes far beyond the, the scope that we see. It's like that mirror. Objects in the mirror are, are, closer than, are not what they appear to be. It's not just about what we can see, but what we can see. That example that we serve can help somebody else. And sometimes we may or never even know it. Did it help that person? That's what this woman did. Dorcas served. She did that continually. And look at the impact. 
People remember. People remember the life that we live. I think about Priscilla and Aquila who took Apollos who was misguided and misinformed who was teaching the baptism of John instead of the correct baptism. They took him aside privately and taught him. Oh, but I thought, I thought women can't teach a man. Right there in Scripture you have the example. There's a difference between taking somebody aside and showing them the way than standing in public teaching. The difference. Because the Great Commission is not just for men. It's for the church as a whole. We all can influence someone to obey the gospel. Some, uh, it's all in different. It's not always the same way, but it's, there's a lot of things that we play in that. Romans 16, 1 and 2, I commend you to our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many, and of myself as well. I want to conclude with this. Proverbs 31, 28-31. Talking about this worthy woman. This woman of God. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also. And he praises her. Fellas, I include myself. How much do we praise our wives? Do we say, I, I'm glad, I am thankful for the wife that I, that I have? Because she sets the example in the home of what it means to be a godly woman. We should be ecstatic to tell people, hey, hey look, let, me tell you about, let me tell you about my wife. Un- Shame. Because she is valued in the home, just just like we are valued in the home. There's equal value. Saying, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. It's not about what you're wearing, what clothing you wear. You can have the biggest name line. Clothing you can wear, the best dress, sparkles that shone, that shines throughout the whole entire world, and everybody says, "Wow, look at that dress!" But their heart could be as, as dark as as dark can be. God values the heart more than the outside apparel, and that's who this husband says. You excel them all because your inward beauty is far exceeding of your outward. You serve as the example. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. So the question is, ladies, are you a woman of God? Are we serving Christ? And that that even goes for us, uh, us as a whole. Are we serving Christ? Are we setting an example so that others can follow and serve Christ themselves? I want you all to remember God loves you. He understands you. He knows if you're going through grief. There are a lot in this room whose mother is not here anymore. There are some that, that have mothers that who perhaps who are here, and I don't know if in, in this building or not, but there are people in this world who have had mothers that have been abusive and whatever the case may be. And as tragic and and, and sad as that that stuff is, I hope they know and I hope we let them know that God loves them and that they are valued. And to not let that deter them from serving God because we can serve God no matter the circumstance that we've been in. God understands our pain even when nobody else does. He's the one that does. But may we always remember that. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the examples that have been set before us through your word. The women who have served you, who have served others, who have been selfless, who have given us an example of which we can pattern ourselves after. We're so thankful for women, whether they are mothers or not. 
for the things they do for the, for the church and one another. Help us as men to appreciate the women who have helped this church and helped the church as a whole and also help the, help the women to appreciate the men as well. Help us to always be that, see our value that we have in you despite what man may say. And help us to be the people of God that we ought to be. We know sometimes it's a struggle, but we know that you can help us because you've given us your word. We ask this for Son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You may have a need to respond to this invitation this morning, and if you do, please come now as we stand and as we sing.